distributed into the environment without the proper government permits. There has to be a paper trail, there has to be a permit. If there has to be a permit, that means that someone has to be responsible. So, if you can prove that this stuff is on your land, that it led to the failure of your crops, there has to be a paper trail for when and where this happened. There has to be some liability somewhere. So, my guess is that we should all start sending out our Freedom of Information Act requests regarding the guidelines that are set forth in Title 50, Chapter 32, Section 1512. Look it up. You can find it on the net. Right on. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to do something like Mara said about the hyperspectral analysis. Has anybody done it yet? I think... Uh, Clifford Carnicom down in New Mexico has. That's how we originally determined what the materials were in the chemtrails, the aluminum, strontium, and barium. That's where the original the, determination So came it from. has been done. Like, so instead of reinventing the wheel, we actually have this evidence. What funds, Kathy? That's what I would ask. We're trying. I spoke in front of the California Energy Commission in 2010. At that meeting, the Energy Commission authorized and funded a $250,000 spectrometer for that exact purpose. Any device of that caliber that the state will recognize is not cheap. I don't have $250,000, and this is where people must understand the degree to which information is being covered up. I served information at that meeting to the state's top scientists. It's the last we ever heard of any of this. That meter is who knows where. If we simply break the dam of silence on this issue, so many wheels will turn. So many will turn. Let's get it on the national yes. news. Yes. Expose yes. it a la yes. Geraldo Rivera style. Say, here we go. We're on national news. It's yes. events. That will put us on the radar. I wholeheartedly agree with Kathy. Thank you. It's going to take the pressure of the people. And if you look at each other, you're the people here. And it's going to take your pressure. And your pressure from this movement will create more pressure and more pressure until somebody starts listening. And when that starts to happen, then that's when this will turn around, okay? I'm a college student, and I go to Shasta College here. And um, I think you need to get a group of college students going to every university. That needs to be a mission. I would be a part of that. I would lead that. There's other activists here. I hope you connect with before you leave. If we can build that list and build that list of contacts in colleges, as you suggest, I will, Geoengineering Watch will do its best to supply as many flyers as we possibly can for free to those groups. If, we, if I can just have the help in locating contacts in those locations, we'll supply them as much as we possibly can. The real question that I have is, there's been samples pulled from the air and the water, but has there been any sa samples pulled from the airline filtration systems from high altitude airlines? As far as collecting samples from aircraft uh, of the chemtrails and uh, trails that are being left by other aircraft, yes, there is a company, I believe it's called Atmospheric Analytics Incorporated. They have uh, what amount to Learjets that have these little devices on the side that will suck in the air sample and collect it. So yes, there is a way to do it. It's not cheap, but it can be done. Dr. Davis, you've spoken before about finding um, hair analysis in, in children, in infants. I'd like to hear more about that. Is that in the Bible, we're taken from dust and we're going to go back to dust. The dust is the 103 elements of the universe. We need 64 of them in the right ratio that allows our genetic expression to be all it can be. What I find on a regular basis, the average American is deficient on all lines in this mineral war. However, the toxic elements are extremely active and they will take on and they'll sit on a receptor site where the normal nutrient metal should be. So as an example, aluminum will sit where magnesium should sit on the receptor site in the behavior of a cell. So the drama is, going back to a question about air filters, this is nanoparticles. This is beyond what your eye can see by 30,000 fold. This is something you cannot filter out. And yet when you breathe it, it goes straight into your nostrils. You have no defense against it. It will end up in your brain. And then as you breathe, it'll also go into your lungs. There's no defense of get that. However, you do have a God-given ability to get that out. So, in the, so at the final day, what you have is, is there a way to test if I am poisoned? And the answer is yes. 
The drama is your body will not allow it to stay in the bloodstream. So doing a blood test is useless. Doing a urine test is useless because your body's desperately trying to get rid of it. It'll get rid of it through, it may stay, store in your kidneys and in your liver. Anybody want to do a kidney biopsy? No. So the most efficient, inexpensive way to do things are with clinicians who will do DMPS and DMSA challenges, which will force the cells to let it go. However, those particular procedures sometimes are toxic and you have some difficulty with that because you're freely letting go for the first time a toxic load. For me and my house and my clinicians I work with, we use a simple hair analysis because it's an excretory canal to get rid of poisons because your skin is your third kidney. You get rid of the poisons through your liver, through your colon, through your kidneys, through your skin. And your hair just happens to be living in your skin. So whatever is in your bloodstream will show up in your hair. So the point is, question, taking baby's hair and then shaving it, sending it off to a CSI lab and getting an analysis back, in a perfect world, you should have no aluminum, inorganic aluminum in your body. And when that mark comes back high, when cadmium comes back high, when strontium comes back high, and barium comes back high on babies, we have a toxic problem. Thank you. Yes, my question is for Mr. McCandless. I recently read a paper you wrote describing how um, the nanoparticulates were used in the jet fuel. Uh, to create a stabilization um, in the fuel at high altitudes. I found that very interesting. The particular um, practice of putting nanoparticles or uh, nanometal particles in jet fuel, there was actually a NASA study that was done, released in May of 2001. Um, yes, there we go, right there. It's um, entitled Nanotechnology and Gelled Cryogenic Fuels. Now, the study goes into a lot of different areas, everything from rocket propulsion to regular turbojet engines, the kind you see on airliners, including uh, the proposal to <coughs> include uh, Jet Fuel A and JP-8, which are fuels that you find in jet airliners and military aircraft. The idea is that if you have oxide-coated aluminum, that is two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. When it's consumed in the combustion reaction, it releases all that oxygen and it produces a much more efficient combustion. Of course, the aluminum metal comes out the exhaust pipe afterwards and it winds up being in part of the trail. The trick is that you're essentially containing an oxygen supply in the fuel itself, which means you can go to much higher altitudes where there's not that much oxygen. Right. It gives you an advantage militarily. It gives you an advantage as a commercial carrier because you can go much further on less fuel. The problem is eventually it comes down as fallout that we breathe. First of all, I want you to bring up, I'd like to bring the, would be the correlation between HARP and the enhancement that HARP does to the geoengineering. Most people have heard of the HARP facility. It's an ionosphere heater. The acronym is High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program. But there are at least, we believe, two and a half dozen of these large ground-based facilities around the globe, an unknown number of smaller RF transmitters. They appear everywhere on the radar. And, and this, the, the radio frequencies are a huge part of the climate modification. So we're all walking in tennis at this point, literally. We're more conductive. The atmosphere over the continental US has been measured at 400% its historic conductivity. All this enhances the RF frequencies. And again, in the case of HARP, we're talking about three and a half billion watts, billion with a B. There are no studies on much of the long-term effects, but these, as Mark explained very well, this is part of how they move the air masses around. Mark explained that extremely well. So these are completely connected aspects of climate engineering. You can't separate the two. So there's a lot of aspects to it other than the trails that we see so visibly. None of them benevolent and none of them in our best interest. And a biological effect to this, just so that you'll know, is that the more aluminum is in your body, the more sensitive you are to these fields. And what happens is we're seeing more and more people being energetically sensitive so that they can't even walk through a mall and other places or hold cell phones and whatnot because they themselves have become, I remember when I came to Reading in 85, we only had a couple of TV stations, we put aluminum foil on the uh, antennas. <laughs> You're now the new aluminum foil. I live in Reno, Nevada, and uh, 
you had uh, on your website an interview with the guy that was a director at the uh, uh, Desert Research Institute. The day after that that interview happened, the sky was waffled even more than normal. And it, well, the bottom line was he said that silver dioxide is not harmful to the body. And that's the only thing they use in, in cloud seeding. And the thing that I've noticed after living in Reno for four years is that the more they seed, the less it rains, and wanted to know what that, why that is. When you put these particles into the air, because they're so small, moisture and ice crystals have a tendency to naturally gravitate towards these particles. If you heat the particles up, you can then carry the moisture to a higher altitude where the jet stream will carry it further downstream like a conveyor. So you can prevent the rain from falling where it would normally fall. That's one of the reasons. And because they're preventing the rain from falling right here in California, anywhere on the east of the Mississippi when it's got to rise again, they're getting rained on like hell. So all that stuff following in Tennessee and Arkansas is uh, California water.